Welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the notes worksheet entitled Right Triangle Trigonometry Day 3. So this would be 3 of 4 and it just represents some more problem solving with right triangles. Uh, it looks like there is at least one construction that we're going to be taking a look at. So please just make sure you have a ruler and protractor handy and um, you know we can check out some things there. So there's going to be some word problems that you're going to be dealing with here that have a couple phrases and just want to be very clear about the, what those would mean, especially in, in the context of a right triangle. So angle of elevation, everyone, and then angle of depression. Uh, let's go ahead and, and summarize those two pieces, and then we'll move forward from there. So angle of elevation, this is the one that occurs most often. Um, but basically, an angle of elevation always rotates up from the horizontal. Again, most of the problem solving that you do will probably talk about an angle of elevation there. So what that would mean is you start from the horizontal just like this, and the angle of elevation comes up from the horizontal. So we would be talking about our theta right there. That would be from here to here. And again, in a right triangle, we don't necessarily have to worry too much about the rotation clockwise, counterclockwise. Obviously, it's an acute angle, so it's positive. Um, but in this case, that's, that's what it would be. So the angle of elevation would be really from the horizontal rotating upward like that. Okay, so angle of elevation, um, that occurs most often. The ones that I've seen students struggle with just a little bit over the years is the angle of depression and really what that would look like. And so let me be very clear about its definition and then we'll sketch it out. So just like an angle of elevation rotates up from the horizontal, an angle of depression rotates down from the horizontal. And so no matter how you sketch it out, and, and you're going to find some shortcuts and ways to um, see some connections between an angle of elevation and an angle of depression and all that good stuff, but really what I would do is start it out with the concept of here's your horizontal and an angle of depression rotates down from there. So theoretically that would be your theta right in there. And so immediately I would start drawing a right triangle that looks like this, and then if you can add to it and work with it and, and modify it, that's great. But essentially that's what the angle of depression would look like. And again, I know it's a clockwise rotation, and I know you see that here, um, but it's not a negative angle because we're talking about um, it as an acute angle in a right triangle. So that would be your theta. So just keep that in mind as you do some of the problems. Um, what that would look like and then how your sketches are. And if you need to run any of your sketches by me before solving, please don't hesitate to do that. Okay. Well, uh, before we can do our construction for the day, we do want to take a look at, at this one mathematical piece that has been missing. And so the example one, it says, how would you solve for theta and what is theta? Well, basically what we have now is, is the separation here between inputs and outputs. The previous problems that you worked on, you would have theta, you would basically have the input, but you would be missing part of the ratio, part of the output, and that's what you would have to solve for. In this particular case, of course, what I'm looking for is if I have the ratio, if I have the output, what angle produces that output? And so um, let's just take a look at this from a mathematical vantage point, and then we'll write a few things in, um, try to be visual with it as well. Now, you don't have to write this on your paper. I'm just kind of thinking out loud with this, and then I'll probably erase. But basically, you want to solve for theta. And so in order to solve for theta, you have to undo the cosine ratio. Now, let me be clear, of course. This is not multiplication, so I'm not going to divide by cosine. What I'm doing in this is, as a function, I'm taking the cosine ratio of theta. And so what I have to do is undo the cosine ratio. Well, as a matter of fact, just as you've seen before, every operation has its opposite, and the cosine, taking the cosine ratio is no different. So in this particular case, in order to undo um, that cosine ratio, I'm going to apply its opposite operation, which is defined as the inverse cosine. So I'm going to take the inverse cosine of the cosine of theta. And when I do something to the left-hand side of an equation, I have to do it to the right side of the equation too. And so what I'm going to do is see this mathematically. These two are going to cancel. Opposite operations cancel each other out. 
Um, and as a matter of fact, this is what's called a composition. So they cancel each other out, and I'm left with theta. And now this is going to be stored on your calculator, taking the inverse cosine of 0.4381. We'll get that momentarily, and that would be our theta. What does that mean? Well, trigonometrically, let's just take a very brief peek here. And again, you don't have to write this down. You can just look up here. What it basically is saying in this case is I have a cosine ratio of 0.4381, meaning that if I was to take the adjacent side and divide by the hypotenuse, again, that would just be one way to represent it. If I was to take the adjacent over the hypotenuse, it would be that number right there, 0.4381. There is a single angle that would produce that particular cosine ratio. And that's what your calculator is going to give you. What angle has a cosine ratio of 0.4381? In the context of a right triangle, you're asking the calculator to say, what angle would have an adjacent over hypotenuse of 0.4381? Okay, well, let me erase this piece and we'll write a few things in place there. Hopefully that makes at least some decent sense as to what it's asking for and how we're going to solve it. So to undo cosine, we're going to do an inverse cosine. And so that's what I'm going to write right here. Take the inverse cosine, really of both sides of the equation. But basically what's going to happen here, of course, everybody, is when I do it on the left, I just get rid of cosine. And when I do it on the right, I get my numerical value for theta. So let's go ahead and see what that is. Let's bring up the calculator again. And please just make sure you are in degree mode on the calculator. I'm going to go ahead and clear some previous stuff out. And uh, in this case, what I'm asking for is the inverse cosine. And by the way, let's find it on the calculator. Here's the cosine button. And notice what the second feature is on that particular button. It's opposite operation, really the inverse cosine. So everyone hit second and then cosine. So inverse cosine 0.4381. So what angle has an adjacent over a hypotenuse ratio of 0.4381? And as you can see, it's about 64.02 degrees. And so I'm going to write that over here. Theta equals 64.02 degrees. Excellent. And that's how we're going to undo the ratio. We're going to do its inverse. So if I have a tangent of theta equals 2.6201, let's derive just a little meaning for it. It basically is asking what angle has an opposite over adjacent, because that's tangent, what angle has an opposite over adjacent ratio of 2.6201? Well, we're going to take the inverse tangent. And excuse my shorthand here, getting a little lazy, but just going to put quotes. So take the inverse tangent of both sides of the equation, and I'll do that with you, of course. If you can grab your calculator with me, that would be great. And again, I'm going to do second tangent and 2.6201. So remember, you're asking the calculator to come up with the angle that has an opposite over adjacent ratio of 2.6201. And there it is, about 69.11 degrees. All right, good. So in this case, given the output, finding a way to calculate the input. One more here, everybody. So take inverse sine. Again, et cetera, et cetera there. And watch what happens on this one when I do that. So I'm going to go ahead and do inverse sine. So second and then the sine button. And it looks like I have 1.0024. Now remember what this is asking here, everybody. So it's saying, what angle will have an opposite over hypotenuse ratio of 1.0024? Opposite over hypotenuse ratio. And in this case, watch what happens. Oh, I end up getting an error. And so let's explore this. Um, let's just write no answer or undefined, however you want to write that on your paper. But it's basically saying I can't do that. I can't have an opposite over hypotenuse ratio, apparently, of 1.0024. Hey, let's just take a quick peek at why that is. 
So here's a right triangle, everybody, and here's your theta. Think about in a right triangle specifically, here's the opposite, here's the hypotenuse. Can I ever have an opposite that is larger than the hypotenuse? Because that's the only way I can get a sine ratio above 1 is if the opposite is bigger than the hypotenuse. And of course, in a right triangle, we know the hypotenuse is the larger number. So you can see, of course, everybody, opposite over hypotenuse is always going to be a number in a right triangle between 0 and 1. So I can't take the inverse sine of 1 point something. I can never have a sine ratio above 1. And as a matter of fact, think back to the unit circle. Did we ever see a sine ratio above 1? No, absolutely not. And so in our second representation, we're seeing the same thing unfold. And when we define our functions for the third and what will be the final time in all its glory, we still will never be able to have a sine ratio above 1. Okay, let's do our um, one construction here for the day and throw some strategies in place. So it says uh, construction 1, given two sides of a right triangle, we should be able to find everything else. So please, guys, construct it. Do the calculations with your numbers and then measure to see if you, if you were able to get everything correct. So here's what I'll ask you to do. Just uh, give me a horizontal line segment. And uh, how about we go 90 degrees from the right endpoint when you get an opportunity. Again, 90 degrees from the right endpoint. And um, something like that. Let's go ahead and just draw our side up and create a right triangle, something like that. So take a little time, if you would. Come up with a right triangle just like that. And if you remember the standard approach, everybody, little a, little b, little c, and then big A across from A, big B across from little b, et cetera, et cetera, and big C is the right angle. Okay, so that is going to be our standard approach right there. Uh, I'm hoping at this point you've constructed that. And as it says, we're going to be given two sides of a right triangle. What I'm going to try to do is have it be a little different potentially than the one that's um, down on your page here, and let me just make sure I see it. So, okay, that's good. I just want to do something a little different than those two sides. So, how about this, everyone? Why don't we measure, let's do B and C. So, everyone measure B and then measure C, and that'll be it. So, take, take a moment, and I'm going to go ahead and put numbers in. My numbers are going to be fairly random here, but if I measure little b from there to there, I'm going to go ahead and put my number in. And if I measure little c from here to here, I'm going to put my number in. So something like that. Again, please use your numbers, of course. I think on the previous notes, uh, notes worksheet, what we did is we circled these to kind of distinguish between what was given and what we solved for. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and circle those two pieces. And that'll be it. Based, based on that premise right there, we should be able to solve for the remaining three parts. One side, two angles. We'll see if we have success with that. So again, make sure you're ready to go, with the, uh, go on the next step with me. Um, you have two sides measured, and you have those numbers in place. And I, I'm hoping you did B and C like me, just because I want to make it different than the, the next couple examples we'll see. Okay. Hey, guys, it's a three-step process. One side, two angles. I would say um, let's find the third side first there. So anytime we're talking about a right triangle, and you can see it's pretty much the reverse of the previous notes worksheet. How about use the Pythagorean theorem to um, solve for the third side. So everyone, if you don't mind, take an opportunity, if you would, and do the Pythagorean theorem. I'll just spend a little time doing it up here on mine. But let's go ahead and get little a, and I'll go ahead and throw mine in. So for me, it's this. For you, obviously, it's going to be different. But uh, let's see if you can get that squared away. There we go. And then I'll put my number in. So for me, it was about 7.16. So not too bad. Again, I always start out with, with something nice and easy. In this case, getting that third side shouldn't be too big of a problem. Okay, now, guys, it's the angles that, that we're going to have to deal with here. And so if you would, just like you did on the previous notes worksheet, put an asterisk next to number 2. That's what we're going to try to solve for. Um, and we've, we've got to get an angle, I guess. So 
So here's the only one that requires trig. Use a trig equation. Here's how I wrote it. So use a trig equation to find the first acute angle. Obviously, two acute angles. We're going to find the first of the two. And here's the thing, and you'll be seeing this all unit long. Anytime we need to find the angle, anytime we're trying to find the input of our trig functions, we're going to be using an inverse. So that's what I'm going to write right here. You will use an inverse. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Anytime we need the input of a trig function, you're going to be using the inverse. Okay. Well, um, let's, let's do A. That's the easiest one to measure. So let's, let's solve for it, and then you can actually see if you did it correctly. And let's use the two sides that were given in the problem. So this would be little b and little c. And so let's talk about A there, and I'm just going to do a little work off to the side. Just going to think about A for a second. And basically, in reference to A, it looks like I had the adjacent side and I had the hypotenuse. Those were the two sides that were, were given in this problem. As soon as I hear the words adjacent and hypotenuse, I'm thinking cosine. So it's the cosine of angle A that should be equal to our adjacent side over our hypotenuse. So put those two numbers in place, whatever you uh, measured, make sure you use your numbers. Now, this should look like above where we're trying to find A, and I have to undo cosine. So theoretically, for me, A is just equivalent to the inverse cosine of my adjacent over my hypotenuse, just like that. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. If you want to get this as a decimal and then kind of go from there, that's perfectly fine, but you shouldn't really need to. I'm just going to bring up my calculator and type it in as exactly as you see it on the board. So uh, let's see. Oh, there it is. So inverse cosine. Take your adjacent side, everybody. Divide by your hypotenuse. And again, what you're asking the calculator to come up with is the angle that has that particular cosine ratio, that particular adjacent over hypotenuse ratio. And so I do that right there. And good enough for me, I'll round it up to 38.5, and that sounds good. So let me write that in here, 38.5 and degrees. Again, just make sure you were in degree mode on your calculator, and then that looks pretty good right there. Okay, so that's the key. Now, everyone, uh, I'll pause for a sec and, and ask you to pull it off. Grab your protractor and measure angle A. Whatever you got in terms of a number, it should be that piece right there. So confirm it if you would. Angle A should be exactly what you calculated. Perfect. And if you're able to pull that off, then really all downhill from here. Uh, we just need angle B. And of course, um, I guess this is the way I wrote it last time, so I'll try to stay consistent. Second acute angle is the complement of the first acute angle. So everyone just do a 90 minus and should be in good shape there. I believe if I do 90 minus for mine, should be about 51.5. And that's it. That's how it's going to work, everyone. Okay, so those are the strategies used. We'll do an example with this just to see if uh, we can all get the same numbers and then uh, start to round this out. There's just um, one more problem here, very basic, and then just a quick application that we'll do on the back. All righty. So everyone, let's take a moment in this case, and you know it's up to you how you want to pull this off. It looks like we're going to need little c, big A, and big B, something like this. So it says solve the right triangle, really meaning just find the remaining three pieces. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and pause the video and do it yourself and then come on back and then I'll walk you through and um, you can just see if you got those right as, as I go through the process myself. Okay, well, let's see how you did there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at mine and bring it up. I'll try to do it rather quickly for you so you can just see if you got them right, but uh, if there are any issues at all, you let me know. So 
14.6 squared plus 8.2 squared. Let's do that correctly. There we go. And square root. And about 16.75, give or take. All right, so there's your first. Now I'm going to go ahead and find angle A. So here's angle A, everybody. This represents the opposite side. This represents the adjacent side. Opposite and adjacent. As soon as I hear opposite and adjacent, I'm thinking tangent. So tangent of A is equal to 8.2 over 14.6. And all I need to do is inverse tangent of whatever that number is right there. And again, you can get a decimal on it. Unnecessary, though and should work out pretty nicely here. So let me bring up my calculator another time. And so I'll go ahead and calculate inverse tangent 8.2 divided by and then 14.6. Perfect. And I get about 29.32 degrees, somewhere right in there. And I'll write that in. Okay, so hopefully you are two for two at this stage. And then the only other thing to do at, at, right at this point is just do 90 minus. So 90 minus 29.32, and we get 60.68. And that's how it should work. Okay, so uh, take a look at those. If you have any issues with what you see on, on your screen there, let me know. Uh, but that's what I'm getting in terms of those three values. Okay, great. Let's do one more. Now, I kind of made this one up myself. thought it was an interesting one. So uh, I'm definitely an avid hiker, and one of the um, mountains that I climbed is Maroon Peak near Aspen, and it has this just dastardly part. Um, well, basically, as it says, you kind of you sort of walk along a creek. So I guess let me read the problem, and then if I need to improvise on it, I will. So to climb uh, Maroon Peak near Aspen, you hike along a creek for a few miles. I think it's about three miles. And then you proceed to work your way up a hillside to reach the ridge. So you basically, you leave the creek, you make a right-hand turn, and you just go all the way up this hill. And the hillside has an elevation gain of about 2,800 feet. And the walking distance of that 2,800 feet is about 1.2 miles. And so it's to determine the average grade of the climb to the ridge, basically the angle of elevation. That's what I'm going to be looking for here. So it's been a while since I've, I've done this one, but if I remember the elevations correctly, the creek is right at around 10,300 feet. So that's when you uh, leave the creek and you work your way up to the ridge, which is all the way up at 13,100 feet, just the ridge, not, not the top of the peak, but the ridge itself. So from 10,300 to 13,100 is, is about 2,800 feet in elevation gain. And you slog up that elevation gain in about 1.2 miles. So I guess what it would look like is something like this. Now, that's a stretch right there because the angle is actually not that great, although it felt this steep, even though it's not. So 2,800 feet right here, that's the elevation gain. I'm going to be looking for the angle of elevation, everybody. And 1.2 miles, which is, and uh, let's see if I have this one. Oh, yep, I do. So by the way, if I was to take 1.2 and and change it into feet. So I would multiply it by 5280. Uh, it turns out to be about 6,336 feet. So that's the walking distance, and it is pretty much straight. I'm going to show you a picture of it when we finish this problem, and you'll be able to see it. So it's, it's, a, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty straight up. So 6,336 feet walking distance, and you gain 2,800 feet in elevation to pull that off. So what's the, um, what's the angle of elevation to do it? And again, this seems, you know, with me complaining about it, it seems like it should be very steep. It's not, but um, it actually feels quite steep. Well, it's also loose and uncomfortable. It, 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 was a, it was not easy by any means. Well, anyway, guys, uh, I want to find theta. And actually, let me erase that piece. Let's set up a good equation with this. So in order to do this, here's my theta, everybody. I have the opposite side. I have the hypotenuse. As soon as I'm talking about opposite and hypotenuse, really I'm talking about the sine ratio. So the sine of our angle of elevation 
is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse. And now again, we're able to solve for the input, the angle itself, by doing an inverse. In this case, it's the inverse sine ratio. And so we'll go ahead and do that piece. Let's see, I have, if I remember this correctly, the angle of elevation is about 26.22 degrees. Again, which seems pretty harmless, um, but it, it, was, it was quite steep walking up. Plus at that uh, uh, altitude, uh, does not make it easier. But anyway, that's, that would be the answer there, using the inverse sine, getting 26.22 degrees. Let me show you, I actually have this kind of posted up here. I have a picture of it and you can kind of see it. So there it is. So here is the creek, I'll just follow it along with my cursor. Here's the creek right here, going up about three miles. And here is, is where you hit about 10,300 feet. And you can see it is actually pretty straight, going all the way up there. Um, you do a little zigzagging along the way, very loose, un again, very unpleasant. But basically, you go all the way up until you hit the ridge right here at about 13,100 feet. And then you go on the back side, and then that's where the real climbing begins until you get the summit right up at the top. So anyway, you can just get a, a feel for that particular one. Okay, perfect. All right, well, um, that's day three of right triangle trigs, some good problem solving to look at. And um, just make sure you're in degree mode on the calculator and you're working through these properly. Set them up and work through, and please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, thanks for listening, of course. And um, great. If you have questions, let me know.